Several weeks back when I was uh, just praying and asking God um, about this next series and what I should do as we head into Easter and all of that, I I kept hearing this one word over and over and over again, and it's the word hope. And as I thought about that, I thought, man, after a year of COVID and all that we've been through, is there a better word that we could use in this time than the word hope? And I hope that you will stay with us on this journey because beginning today for the next five weeks, six weeks as we head into Easter, each Sunday I'm going to be looking at hope from a little bit different perspective. And and I want to give you um, encouragement. I want to share with you some things that I hope will lift you, inspire you, and encourage you. Come on, it's just us and it's okay. How many of you be honest enough to say, Pastor Steve, you know what? I think I could use a little more hope at this time in my life. Anybody? Yeah. And I, I, I hope also that you won't keep this to yourself. I, my prayer is that you'll invite some other people to come along with you or to join us online because I really believe that this is some stuff that everybody needs. I saw this uh, online. I thought this was just a great picture. Throw that up on the screen for me. It said, man can live 40 days without food, three days without water, eight minutes without air, and only one second without hope. And I think there's a lot of truth in that statement. Well, we want to kick off the series today. I want to introduce you to a story uh, that may be familiar to some of you uh, about a woman who didn't just need hope. She needed desperate hope. Have you ever been in a place in your life where desperate was the word that would describe you? Desperate need of finances, desperate need uh, of physical healing, desperate need uh, in your marriage, or desperate need in a relationship that you're in for God to do something, desperate need in your own life where you felt like you've just come to the end of your rope. Man, when you get to the end of your rope, what do you do? Well, that's what we want to discover today. If you want to take your sermon outline out, you can track along with me. If you're one of those who, who likes to take notes, we'll throw the passage of Scripture up on the screen for you. There are Bibles in the pews in front of you. You're more than welcome to use those, though the version I'm going to use is a little different from that. But those Bibles are also our gift to you. If you need a Bible or have a friend who could use one, please feel free to take one of those home with you. They're, they're our gift. We'd love you, to, love you to have one. Mark chapter 5 Uh, Jesus is approached by a man whose name is Jairus. And Jairus is a leader in the synagogue. He's a very important guy. But his daughter is deathly ill, and she's dying. And she comes to Jesus, and he comes to Jesus, and he says, Master, my daughter is really ill. Will you come with me? And this is where we pick up the story. So Jesus went with him, and all the people followed, crowding around him. There was a woman in the crowd who had suffered for how long? 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors over the years, and she had spent everything she had to pay them, but she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus. So she came up from behind him in the crowd, through the crowd, and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. And immediately the bleeding stopped, and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus uh, realized at once that healing power had gone out from him. So he turned around in the crowd and he asked, Who touched my robe? His disciples said to him, look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. And then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell down on her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And Jesus said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. When I sat down with this story this week, um, I asked God to show me a couple of things. One, I asked God to show me something that you would really need to hear. And the other thing is I, I asked God, I said, Lord, show me some stuff. I've read this story hundreds of times. Show me some stuff I've never seen before. And I think God has done both. 
I want to use this story for those of you who may be in desperate need today. I want to use this story to help you understand how you can connect with your desperate hope. Are you ready? Here we go. Let me give you some thoughts that kind of jumped out to me about the Alice story. Here's the first one. Never underestimate how important you are to Jesus. Never underestimate how important you are to Jesus. What was this woman's name? We don't know. It wasn't mentioned. Who was her family? We have no idea. Was she anyone of significance at all? There's nothing listed there. Now, what I want you to get is picture this story. Jesus is, is, is approached by a man who's a synagogue leader. He was a big deal. He has an entourage of people with him. Jesus has his disciples around him. Obviously, there were people of notoriety who wanted to get close to Jesus. All of those people were all around Jesus. And then there's this woman who nobody knows anything about. And she's the one who gets to the ground. And Jesus stopped everything that he was doing with this synagogue leader and all these very important people to to touch a nobody like her. She was important to Jesus. She had no idea how important she was. In fact, what's really wild when you look at it, what this woman didn't understand was that she was the very reason Jesus had come from heaven to earth. Jesus said, I've not come to call righteous people to repentance. He goes, I, I've not come for people who are well. I've come for the people who are sick. Over and over again, Jesus took women who were cast aside by society and elevated them and helped them understand they were important to God. Jesus took children who were looked like uh, as kids were in the way, and, and he brought them to him to show people how important children were to Jesus. Over and over again, the poor, the sick, those with leprosy, all these people with all these problems, and over and over again, Jesus said, these people are important to God. And you know what? You're important to God. I, I don't know who you are. I have no idea what you're dealing with. No idea what your background is. Uh, no idea how much you know or don't know about God. But you know what? None of that really matters. Because God loves you more than you could possibly imagine. This is so important. Because, you know, sometimes when we deal with our struggles, sometimes when we're in the midst of our problems and all the stuff that we're facing, you know, it, it's just really easy sometimes to think, God has forgotten me. God doesn't even notice me. I, I, I wonder if God even hears me when I pray. Look at me. He does. He does. You're more important to him than you know. I, I love in Ephesians chapter 3, this is uh, the Passion Translation. It's a new translation that's just being developed. Uh, but I love because it's so descriptive with the language. I love how it says this about God's love. Look at it. It says, how deeply intimate and far-reaching is God's love. How enduring and inclusive it is. Endless love beyond measurement that transcends our understanding. This extravagant love pours into you until you are filled to overflowing with the fullness of God. I, I love it. I wrote this in my notes. I put it on your outline. I said, you know what? If we knew how much God loved, loved us, we would come to him more frequently than we do. Look, look at me for a second. I just want you to get this. You see, so often we think that our lives don't matter. So often we feel like we're just insignificant specks on this globe. But did you hear the song that we started with today? For God so loved you, he sent his one and only son. And if God loves you enough to send his son to die in your place, don't you think he will hear you in your time of desperate need? Amen? Amen. You betcha. Second, second thing that jumped out to me is this, and I know some of you will be able to identify this. Come to Jesus sooner, not later. <laughs> Come to Jesus sooner, not later. Uh, 
Come on, just us. How many of you be honest enough to admit you're a little bit like me and you tend to put things off uh, from time to time? Anybody do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And sometimes it comes back to bite you, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, probably six, seven years ago, um, I was up in Kansas uh, speaking at something, and uh, I was driving back down I-35 in my, my Toyota, and somewhere just north of Blackwell, um, I happened to look down and saw that my uh, temperature light had come on that my car was overheating, and I went, what? And I'm looking at it, and I'm going, what's that all about? And about that time, I start seeing steam come out from underneath the hood. And uh, I'm going, oh, man. And there was a, fortunately, there was a, a, a rest stop right there. And so I pulled off at this rest stop, and uh, I get out of my car, and I pop the hood, and I look underneath. Now, why I looked underneath, I have no idea. I know nothing about cars. I mean, the car would literally have to talk to me and say, this is what's wrong. You know what I mean? I mean, I just, it would, I, I'm looking at, but you know, I'm, in, I'm a guy. And so that's what guys do. We, we open the hood and go, oh, yeah, I, I think my whatchamacallit's out of whack. Or, you know, and, I'm, and I'm looking, and I could see water dripping down. And I thought, you know, I think maybe the water pump went out. You know, I, I know enough to know the water pump kind of circulates. I think maybe the water pump went out. And, and I realized that I was only like a mile or two from Blackwell, and I can't do anything at a rest stop. And uh, so I looked, and there was a garage that was open there. And I thought, oh, I could take my car there. And uh, so I thought, I'm only a mile or two away. Surely I can make it. How many of you see where this is going? Now, if you know anything about cars that overheat, you really shouldn't drive them. But I, I get out on the interstate, and I think I'm close, and I'm maybe two miles away. And I start down the interstate, and I'm kind of trying to be careful. And then, the, you know, the light's back on again, and the steam's coming back. And so I do what every normal person would do when that happens. I drive faster. You know, I, you know the faster I get there, the better off we are. So I, I get in town. I get to Blackwell, and I'm heading toward where the garage is. And somewhere in the middle of Blackwell, Oklahoma, my car dies. It was done. And I pulled over and I called the shop and the guy said, well, we're closing right now. He said, we'll be happy to take a look at it and I'll have to get back to you tomorrow. And I said, okay. And so I found a ride home from Blackwell back to, to Moore. And uh, so the next day I, I called the guy and I said, well, what's, what's the deal on my car? And he said, well, Mr. Childs, I have some bad news. Don't you hate hearing that from a mechanic? I've got some bad news. He said, you drove this car when it was overheated, and he said, this, these valves expanded or whatever. He said, the engine is ruined. He said, you, the car can't be driven. He said, you'll have to replace the engine. And I'm listening to this guy, and I'm thinking, great. I took a couple of hundred dollar problem, and I made it a few thousand dollar problem in the span of just a matter of moments. It's my spiritual gift. You know that? <laughs> How many of you have the same spiritual gift? Yeah. Well, and it, it, it hit me. It, it, that's, that is just a symptom of our human experience. Isn't it a fact how often, man, we get ourselves into a mess, and, and instead, again, instead of humbling ourselves and crying out to God, how often do we go, I'm going to get myself out of this. I'm going to navigate my way through this. I'm gonna, I can fix this. I can do this. And we go and we go and we go until we can't go anymore. You know, this woman was dealing with this issue for 12 years. Now, I don't know how long. Obviously, Jesus wasn't doing public ministry that long. I don't know when the time was when she first heard of Jesus, but when I was reading the story, I, I was thinking to myself, I wonder when the woman was dealing with, I wonder if there was ever a point early on where she came to God, whether she went to, went, went to a, a, a priest or she went somewhere and she began to just cry out and say, I know God is my Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals me. Would you pray with me that God would help? I wonder, I wonder if she ever took it to God or did she just wait until there was no place else to go. After she had spent everything, after she had tried everything, it's like, well, now let's try Jesus. Look at me. You don't have to wait until you're in over your head like that. God can deal with small problems too. Amen? Amen. I love Second Chronicles 16. I thought this is, verse 12, is just such, so typical of how human nature is. It says, in the 39th year of his reign, Asa developed a serious foot disease. Read it with me out loud. 
Yet even the, with the severity of his disease, he did not seek the Lord's help, but turned only to his physicians. That's why I put that statement on your outline. It says, you know what? We often don't seek God until we have made a difficult situation an impossible one. Now, why should you seek Jesus first? Now, for, for all of us who are dealing with stuff, until you get to the end of your rope, if you're not there yet, praise God, why should you go to him soon? Here, here's the reason. The longer you wait, the more you will suffer. The longer you wait, the more you will suffer. The fact of the matter is, this woman postponed her suffering by postponing coming to God with it. And you know what? That happens to us. I don't know what it is you're dealing with, but here's what I know. The longer you wait to come to God, the more you're going to suffer with it. Secondly, the longer we wait, the more damage that we do. Just like with my car. You know, the longer we wait, the longer we put it off, the more damage we do to ourselves, to our lives, to our finances, to our health, to our families. You fill in the blank. Which gets me to the third one. The longer you wait, the more people who are impacted. The more people who are impacted. You know, through the years, I've had, um, I've had the opportunity to sit with a lot of people who are struggling with addictions in their lives. And, and one of the sad things for those of us who have struggled with addictions is that from the moment we first identify it, we, we put off really dealing with it. And the sad part of it is the longer we wait, the more that it only damages us. It damages those who we are in relationship with. And again, I can't even begin to tell you how many people I've sat with who didn't deal with the problem that they were struggling with, didn't, weren't forthright with it, didn't come to God with it. And because of that, it cost them their spouse. It cost them their kids. It cost them their job. They've done so much damage and hurt so many people. Come to Jesus sooner, not later. Let me give you a third thought. Desperate hope, it begins with a desperate act, with an act of desperate faith. Desperate hope begins with an act of desperate faith. You know, this woman, you don't really catch this in the text, but this woman was not supposed to be there. Um, Because of her bleeding, she was ceremoniously unclean, which means she wasn't supposed to be around people. In fact, by law, she was supposed to, whenever anyone got near, declare, I'm unclean, I'm unclean, to keep people away. But I want you to notice in this story what happened. She heard about Jesus. She knew Jesus was passing by. But notice in the story, she didn't come out and get in front of Jesus. She didn't get out where Jesus could see her or the people could see her. She came up to him from behind. Somehow, she made her way through the crowd. My guess is she she kept whatever hood or shawl she had pulled up where nobody could see her face. And she kept making her way through the crowd, getting closer and closer. Because she believed, if I can touch, touch him. That one desperate act of faith, if I can just touch him, I can be healed. And that desperate act of of faith opened her life to the desperate hope that Jesus could give. <laughs> one, of my, uh, one of my favorite remembrances here at Chartel, the, several years back, when Debbie Spears was our office manager, I was sitting in my office one afternoon And uh, Debbie comes in to my office, and uh, she said, Pastor Steve, there's a man who has stopped in, and he wants to talk to the pastor. And I said, okay. And she kind of looked, see, make sure he wasn't looking, and she closes my door, and she said, he's really scary. I said, okay. So I opened my drawer, pulled out my nine millimeter. (laughs) No, I don't. I'm from Oklahoma, but I didn't. I didn't, you know. So I come out, and um, there's this guy. He's a, he's a big old guy. He's got biker leathers on, you know, and he just uh, got this bandana wrapped around his head. And I come walking up, and I said, hey, I'm Steve. And he goes, are you the preacher? 
And I said, yeah, I'm the preacher, man. This is as good as it gets. What can I do for you? He said, well, can I talk to you, preach? I said, sure. So I took him back to my office and sat down. And he said, preacher, my name's Harlan. And he goes, I run a Narcotics Anonymous group. He said, we've been meeting at a, at a church at a storefront down here not far away. And he said, but they closed that church, and we don't have a place to meet. And he goes, I've been, I've been going to church after church trying to find a place who will let us have a, a, an N.A. meeting at the church. And he goes, we'll pay rent. He goes, we'll pay for our, our, our way. But he goes, nobody, nobody wants our kind around. He, he said, so w- would you be willing to rent us a room? And, um, and I said, well, Harlan, what nights are you looking at? And he told me, and I said, we've got that open. I looked at him, and I said, Harlan, dude, you're an answer to prayer. And he started laughing. He goes, preacher, I've been called a lot of things. He said, but I ain't never been called nobody's answer to prayer. <laughs> and I said, well, Harlan, I said, man, we have been praying about recovery groups, and we've been praying about trying to help people find uh, help from their addictions. And I said, I think having an NA group here is a great step forward. So I said, we'll be happy to let you use the room for free. And Harlan said, no, preach, can't do it for free. He goes, we got to pay our way. He said, but uh, I appreciate the offer. And we worked it out, and their, their NA group began meeting. Again, this was several years back. And um, one day, he, sometime later, a few months later, uh, he was in the office, and he, he stopped in to, to give Debbie a, a, the check to rent their room. And I spotted him, and I went out, and I said, Harlan, you got a minute? And he said, yeah. I said, well, come on back to my office again. He sat down. I said, Harlan, tell me your story. I said, you know, how, how did you end up here doing this? He started laughing. He goes, well, he goes, I grew up in home. He said, my old man was an alcoholic. And he said, so I began drinking young. He said, by the time I was 10, man, he said, I was a full-blown alcoholic. He said, by the time I was 12, I was taking other drugs. He said, by the time I was 15, he goes, I was popping everything that you could pop. And he said, you know, I, I used to have a part-time job, made a little money. He said, but I, I started to end up trying to steal and, and get away. And he said, I ended up in and out of juvie. And he goes, I was 17 years old. And I said, I just got arrested again for stealing some money for trying to take care of my habit. And he goes, I ended up in front of a judge. And the judge said, boy, I'll give you two choices. He said, you can either go to jail or you can go to Vietnam. And he said, I decided I'd serve my country. He said, so I signed up, and he said, I headed off to Vietnam. He goes, I had no idea what to expect. He said, preacher, I got there. Drugs were everywhere. He said, it was like candy land. He said, man, he said, anything you wanted, you could get. And he said, whatever I wasn't using, I started using there. He said, I developed some friends. And he goes, I came back to the States. And he said, I had some contacts. He goes, I met a woman, and we got married, and she liked to take drugs too. And he said, we started taking drugs together, and we both held down part-time jobs. And he said, finally, he said, man, we popped out a couple of kids. And he said, we ended up living in our, my truck out in California. He goes, we would go to a state park, and you could stay for two weeks. We said, ma'am, he said, we would stay in the state park. He said, we'd get up in the day and we'd go to town and do what we could to make a little money and buy some drugs and sell some drugs. And he said, buy a little food. And he goes, that was how we lived. And I said, why'd you quit? He got real quiet. He said, one day, I said, my wife and I, had the kids and he said we were dumpster diving he said we used to put the kids in the dumpsters and see what kind of stuff they could find that we could sell or food that we could eat and he said one day he said my little two-year-old daughter come up out of a dumpster and he said she had a, a syringe in her hand that she had a big smile on her face because she, she knew she had found something good. And he said, I'm standing there looking at my two-year-old two year little girl holding some drug addict syringe in her hand. And I realized what I had become. He said, and I looked up to heaven and I said, God, help me. And he got a big smile on his face. And he said, and he did. He said, I took my family into town. He said, we found a woman who uh, worked with a, a rehab agency. And he said, they helped us get us an apartment. And he, he said, I started into rehab. And he said, I made God a promise that if God would help me get clean and sober, 
I would spend the rest of my life helping other people find their way to freedom as well. The entire trajectory of Harlan's life changed with a very simple act of faith. God, help me. Look at me. Don't miss this. I don't care what you're dealing with. I don't care what you're facing. I don't care what you're going through. This God who loves you so much is listening to you. And if you will truly in faith cry out to him, there is no limit to what God won't do for you. I love what Jesus said in Mark chapter 9 to a a father who was in desperate need of healing for his son. Mark chapter 9, verse 23. Would you read this out loud with me? Anything is possible if a person believes. Read it with me again. Anything is possible if a person believes. One more time, like you mean it. Anything is possible if a person believes. Look at me. Do you believe? This woman believed that if she could just touch Jesus, she could find healing. Jesus was surrounded in the crowd. I love this in the story how when Jesus goes, who touched me? Disciples are looking at this crowd of people and they're saying, what do you mean who touched you? People are bumping into you left and right all over the place. But you got to get, Jesus doesn't respond to bumps of indifference. He responds to touches of faith. Anything is possible if a person believes. And my prayer for you today is that somehow you will find the strength, having tried everything else in your life, that you will find the strength to cry out to God. Let me give you one last thought. Surrender your life to Jesus And not just your crisis. Surrender your life to Jesus. Not just your crisis. As I was reading the story again this week, one of the things that hit me was the fact that so many of us, when we get in desperation mode, when we come to God, all we want God to do is fix the problem. But God wants to do more than fix the problem. God wants to fix us. Did you notice in the story? I I thought this was so cool. Did you notice in the story that when, as soon as the woman touched Jesus, she was healed. And Jesus, he had places to go. He had had a a task he was trying to do. He was it. But did you notice how Jesus stopped? He didn't let this woman just slip back into the crowd. He didn't let her just slip away. He stopped after she was healed. And he goes, who touched me? And he's looking around and he he spots her. And the Bible says that she came and she fell on her face before him. And and she told him what she had done. And when Jesus saw her, he knew. He knew what was going on for her. And he knew she needed to be uh, more than just healed. She needed to be restored. You see, so often, I I thought of this, and I thought, it's kind of a pun, but isn't it a fact that some of us, when we come to God, all we want God to do is stop the bleeding. But he wants to do so much more. Oh, my God, I just love this so much. The woman comes, she falls before Jesus. And you can just picture Jesus coming over to her. You can see as she's crying with her head down, him putting his, his hand on her head. And do you notice in the scripture what Jesus calls her? What was it? Daughter. Don't miss this. Only time in the Gospels Jesus ever called a woman daughter. Why? Because this woman needed to be more than just fixed. She needed a father. You can come to God with your problem. But God wants to do more than just fix your problem. He truly wants to be your father too. I, I love 1 John 3, 1, one of my favorite verses in scripture. Read it with me, church. See what great love the father has lavished on us 
that we should be called the children of God. That is what we are. This woman came to Jesus for healing. But what Jesus gave her was wholeness. And that's what he can do for you. I I don't know what your desperate need is today. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's your health. Maybe it's your spiritual state of being. Maybe you can identify with this woman. You've looked everywhere in life for something that really has meaning to it. Something to give your life purpose. Something that you can hold on to that lasts. And I'm going to tell you, you're never going to find it until you find the God who created you. But today, just like this woman, your desperate hope can begin to come to you if you are willing to begin with a simple prayer to God. Rachel's going to uh, lead us in a song. It's one of my favorite choruses that that we do. It's a song that says, draw me close to you, Lord. Never let me go. And there are some of you, I know that's what you need. You need the great arms of God to wrap around you, to let you know you're not alone in this world. You don't face these issues all by yourself. Look at me. God's got you if you let him. So as we sing this song, open your heart to him. Open your spirit to him. Invite him to come in and bring you the deep level healing that you really, really need. And restore hope to you. Would you do that? We're going to sing, and then I'm going to pray. And you can pray right where you are, right where you're at. God can hear you. If some of you want to mark this moment, if some of you are looking for this to be maybe a special moment for you, you're more than willing while we sing this to slip out. We have a little altars here at the front that you can come. You can kneel. You can stand before God. You can raise your hands to him or lift your heart to him. You can cry out for the desperate hope that God can bring to you. But don't miss this moment to let God touch you right where you are. Rachel, lead us, would you? Draw me close to you Never let me go And lay it all down To hear you say that I'm here You 
But Father God, as we cry out to you today, you, you know us by name. You know exactly where we are and exactly what we're going through. Father, you know the people who are watching online and the people who are here this morning that, Lord, they're just like this woman. They're at the end of their rope. They've tried everything they know how and they're still coming up empty. And so today, oh God, we cry out to you. Lord, all we have is a small prayer of faith. That's all we've got. But you say that's enough. When the woman just believed that she could touch you and be healed, Lord, we believe that today. So right now, Lord, for every single person who, who's reaching out, who's praying their prayer of faith to you, Father, would you stretch out your arms to them? Would you hold them? Would you pull them close to your heart? Would they know this morning how much you love them, how you've waited for this moment? to bring healing to their life, to bring wholeness to their life, to call them daughter, to call them son. Oh, Father, today, so many this morning are in need of your special touch, the hope that only you can bring. So draw close to us today as we seek to draw close to you. And it's in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Amen.